Well, hello everyone. Today it is June 15, 2023. I will be presenting a paper I presented two weeks ago at IEEE uh, ICC conference in Rome. This is from the work of Dr. Shishi Ren. Shishi was a visiting PhD student at Carleton University. Um, as a scholarship holder from China Scholarship Council. Lots of good work came out of Shishi's uh, visit to Carlton. Shishi worked closely with uh, Dr. Omid Abbasi, a postdoctoral fellow uh, at Carlton, under supervision of uh, Professor Ganesh Karabulut Kurt, who is now with Polytechnic Montreal, myself, and Professor Jian Chen from uh, Shidian University. She, she is uh, from Shidian University. Uh, she completed her PhD now. Um, one of the lines of research that she, she focused was on HAPS enable uh, edge intelligence. I will talk about HAPS in a moment, more detail. Uh, this is a network element in the context of non-terrestrial networks. As a matter of fact, Carlton University has uh, quite a bit of research in the non-terrestrial networks area. I will allude to those at the very end. So the title of the work is HAPS Enabled Parallel Computing for Handoff Control in Vehicular Networks or Intelligent Vehicular Networks. Uh, the first journal paper from this line of work was um, or appeared in November 2022 issue of IEEE Transactions on Vehicular Communications, uh, sorry, Transactions on Wireless Communications. And in the sequel, the second paper is in early access, as you see at the bottom of the uh, slide. Um, and the ICC paper was actually a short version of the second TWC paper. Uh, in order to motivate HAPS, I will be using a few slides from HAPS Alliance's pitch deck. Uh, HAPS Alliance is a mainly industry uh, dominated forum or alliance promoting HAPS uh, there are a number of academic partners as well. Uh, Carlton University is the only Canadian academic partner in HAPS Alliance. Um, uh, HAPS stands for High Altitude Platform Station. It is an entity in stratosphere. Basically, this view graph is uh, making a value proposition for HAPS, stating that uh, in a uh, in an integrated non-terrestrial network architecture, each layer has it is unique features and opportunities. For instance, if you look at the terrestrial network, um, if you are close to a, a small base station, a 5G base station, um, uh, it is very difficult to beat that with anything else. So probably unless there is congestion, your best bet would be to get connectivity from that small cell. Um, on the other hand, HAPS with its uh, 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 bird's eye view line of sight coverage of a large area with a high number of spark beams might bring in um, a huge aggregate capacity, much more than uh, a macro base station on the ground can deliver, uh, and it is not that far away from the ground in comparison to different layers of satellites. Um, I have quite a number of more generic HAPS or stratospheric networks presentations at my YouTube channel. Um, the interested persons can refer to those. Uh, it is not my intention to make a very long introduction today uh, on, on HAPS. Another view graph from HAPS Alliance pitch deck, basically uh, the 
potential of a HAPS go well beyond just connectivity, as you see here, very many different types of applications. I will just highlight one of them, disaster management. As most of you would know, a couple of months ago, there was a huge major earthquake in Turkey and Northern Syria. Uh, it was devastating for a very large area, perhaps about 100,000 people uh, died and millions displaced. Um, and there was a disaster within the disaster in the sense that um, in populated areas, overwhelming majority of base stations are mounted on top of buildings and then buildings uh, collapse partially or in full. One third of all base stations became basically uh, not functional instantaneously. This had a ripple effect in the network and the entire network was uh, down in a very large area. Uh, and you can imagine uh, the very negative impact of this in uh, rescue in the first 24 hours or 48 hours after an earthquake. If there were a haps or at, uh, after the earthquake happened, uh, if it were possible to deploy a haps quickly, uh, this uh, problem could have been encountered uh, to a great extent. Um, now I'm changing the direction of the discussion without uh, drilling it too much. Um, in the HAPS area, there are a number of issues to be sorted out. And when there is an issue to be sorted out, obviously it is good for the research community so that we can basically investigate those issues. Some of these issues are related to uh, ICT, let us say, information and communication technologies, for instance, interference management. But there are uh, things which are uh, outside ICT as well. And uh, perhaps they are even bigger issues. First and foremost, uh, the most appropriate aircraft type is, uh, is a big question mark. There are four major different types. Uh, the first thing that would come to anyone's mind is, is a balloon. Balloon has many advantages like uh, easy deployment and very long uh, endurance. It can stay afloat for months, but it has a major drawback and that is uh, it is uh, control and maneuvering seems to be more difficult than other aircraft types. Uh, airship uh, in the form of a blimp or zeppelin is a very important possibility. Um, um, in the old days, zeppelins and balloons were lifted by uh, helium, uh, but the more contemporary ones use hydrogen, which has a much better lift capability. Then there are fixed, fixed wing uh, vehicles. These are heavier than air, though. Earlier ones were lighter than air. I would divide the fixed wing into two as well. One type is uh, a glider, as you see in the picture. Uh, and then the other one, the one that can be controlled in, in perhaps the best way among all the others is an uncrewed uh, uh, plane. Uh, the downside is that that would require most energy uh, and uh, uh, therefore it is loitering time is limited perhaps in the order of days uh, or a week. Um, again, from HAPS Alliance website, a number of uh, models are shown. Uh, these are uh, being tested as we speak, literally. Um, uh, Airbus and HAPS Mobile are among the leaders uh, in this domain. Um, and then uh, lighter than air aircrafts, various of them. Uh, in particular, these big limbs, the, the two on the right side, uh, have the additional advantage of having tremendous lift capability uh, today, the models can easily lift 100 kilograms of equipment, 
but in future, this might extend to several hundred kilograms of equipment, even a ton of equipment. Very interestingly, um, this is a news item from BBC, BBC Future, just June 14, 2023. Because uh, stratosphere or the potentials of stratosphere is getting attention more and more. Um, until maybe a few years back, this was mainly maybe an academic fantasy, something that seems to have great promise on paper, uh, but it was a niche semi science fiction kind of area. Not anymore. As you see, it is a uh, uh, main uh, international news again, as of yesterday, uh, BBC is uh, highlighting uh, the, the potentials in stratosphere, the vehicle on the uh, left is uh, a Zeppelin by Sky, a, a US company. Um, um, I, I would encourage you to have a look at uh, this article. One reason why it is getting intri increasing interest everywhere is uh, because of this uh, balloon saga in uh, earlier this year in North America. Um, uh, the, uh, I guess, general public for the first time became aware that a lot of things are happening in stratosphere. And, uh, you know, what is it there? What can be done? And things of that sort. Now, the next slide is also very interesting, something very recent from two months ago. Uh, many uh, countries and regions are developing their uh, strategies for 2030s. Uh, this would be the 6G era if you would like to align them with IMT networks. IMT networks are the terrestrial networks, 4G, 5G, 6G. Um, and uh, two months ago, there was a white paper by uh, UK. It is a policy paper. Policy papers are very important because they outline the roadmap for a country endorsed by the government. So what is special in the uh, UK wireless infrastructure strategy roadmap developed by the UK government is that in several places, it is talking about high altitude platform stations. And this is a first, uh, along with, I should say, satellites. Satellites is not surprising because they have been in the policy documents for a very long time. But what is interesting once again is stratospheric networks are making an entry there. In the beginning, as you can imagine, still the attention is rural and remote coverage so that a country like UK has coverage in pretty much every spot in coordination with terrestrial networks, stratospheric networks and satellite networks. But eventually uh, we will be talking about apps, uh, part of uh, or an extension, a natural extension of the terrestrial network. So now I will make a second level introduction with my own slides and uh, viewpoint, I see HAPS as a super macro base station in the skies. So it is a third layer in addition to small base stations, macro base stations on the ground and super macro base stations um, uh, at 20 kilometers height. I, we, in our papers, we call this a vertical heterogeneous network. Um, and uh, uh, we use this term super macro base station in the highlighted magazine paper uh, from two years ago. The salient features of this network are as follows, in particular in comparison to satellite networks, because people are uh, very familiar with satellite networks. First and foremost, it is really close to the ground and uh, there is line of sight most of the time with outdoor users. 20 kilometers, actually, uh, it is operational with LTE. The LTE standard 
as versions which allow uh, links, very long links, um, the, this uh, uh, up to 48 or 62 miles. So uh, with an unmodified LTE air interface, a device on the ground can reach HAPS. That is, that's a big advantage. HAPS is non-orbiting. Uh, it is uh, pseudo-stationary. So all the issues related to or difficulties, challenges, uh, as a result of orbiting, they are not there. HAPS is huge uh, in comparison to a macro base station on the ground, also in comparison to a LEO, even in comparison to a GEO, Geo Earth Orbit Satellite, Geostationary Earth Orbit Satellite. Um, this model uh, that I am showing is 130 meters by 65 meters. So it is like a huge uh, building uh, uh, with a half a ton lift capability. Uh, therefore, you can put a lot of equipment there. So when you have that much equipment, basically you can do much more than connectivity. This point is important and it's a key in today's um, uh, presentation, I will not be talking about connectivity. I will be talking about edge intelligence um, and with lots of servers and so on, uh, it might be, perhaps might be a big enabler. And uh, last but not least, in our region, perhaps is not limited to only rural and remote, but uh, perhaps it is best usage is in uh, in the sky or in, in metro areas, in urban areas um, uh, with lots of enriching functionalities, uh, which I will highlight again in the next slide. Um, but in summary, uh, we are not talking about a separate network rather than a stratospheric network is a natural extension, at least we view it in that way, the terrestrial network, therefore, it is uh, native uh, to, to the design of the terrestrial network. Um, as I mentioned, we uh, refer to that as a vertical head net, one air interface, one device, one network. Um, if we take a metro area in the skies, there might be one or several haps in the form of a constellation and with different types of themes, it can uh, enable very different use cases. For instance, there might be pencil beam antennas for uh, uh, hotspot creation on demand. And uh, on the other hand, with very wide beams, uh, IoT traffic can be captured. Um, here, there are a number of use cases beyond connectivity. And once again, today I will be talking about edge intelligence. Um, uh, I already mentioned resilience uh, in, the, uh, in a case like an earthquake. Uh, this is a sustainable infrastructure. It is also energy efficient because it eliminates line densification of the terrestrial network. It is good for um, surveillance and monitoring. Uh, as well as sensing, um, we have research going on at Carlton University in all angles, including localization, positioning, navigation. Here is an example. Uh, imagine at some point these uh, platforms have very powerful cameras as well. From 20 uh, kilometers, uh, uh, it's possible to detect even at the individual level. So in future, I envision that the vehicles in a metro area might have license plates at the roof of the vehicle. This may not be visible to, to the naked eye, uh, but uh, maybe uh, with certain technologies, hats can see them. And then there any type of traffic infringement in the city uh, will be known instantaneously, whether it is speeding or um, crossing uh, at the wrong place or parking uh, at the wrong spot, you name it. If you take big cities like, like London, UK, or 
um, uh, Shanghai or New York, basically their budget is um, uh, similar to, or actually much bigger than many small countries, obviously the population might be more than 10 million or a few tens of millions, and it, it makes sense to have that big of a budget. So um, perhaps seeing the entire metro area 24 seven as a big brother, big sister in some way, also scary in some way, uh, but it, it can create a lot of opportunities beyond just uh, connectivity. Um, uh, starting about two years ago, in my group and with my collaborators, we have uh, tried to examine in detail all these use cases or potentials of HAPS from very different angles. And these uh, papers are listed here in chronological order starting January 2021. The very first time the, the paper on the left top used the term super macro base station. Uh, the, the second paper uh, um, uh, investigates the potential of uh, reconfigurable intelligent surfaces in, in such a platform because it can have a huge area. The third paper is arguably the most comprehensive paper in the literature in the in perhaps area, uh, both presenting a framework and also a vision 50 plus pages at uh, communication surveys and stories. Um, the following paper, we investigated AI-enabled management of this multi-tier vertical heterogeneous network. Subsequent paper is on, uh, actually the subsequent two papers are on the utilization of apps uh, for uh, enabling uh, aerial networks, basically, uh, helping uh, UAV fleets for cargo delivery and applications of that sort. In the second row, the uh, sorry, in the second column, the first paper is uh, uh, the potential on the potential of hacks in intelligent transportation systems, intelligent highways, which is somehow related to today's presentation as well. Then we have two papers waiting for issues in phone magazine and wireless communications magazine. The first one is on sustainability. This is an important line of research in my group because rather than uh, again putting a small base station everywhere so that a user will statistically be close to a base station um, and note that that approach results in over engineering in a very negative manner, we might just put uh, a HAPS to absorb uh, unpredictable uh, traffic and that results in uh, much lower capex and opex and energy, better energy efficiency. The subsequent paper is uh, again a vision paper on potential use cases, challenges and possibilities. The last three papers are those uh, under review the first one uh, is on anomaly detection uh, and utilizing cats. Once again, a bird's eye view of a, a very large area, um, in particular in a metro area, creates uh, opportunities from a cybersecurity viewpoint as well. Um, the, the next one is uh, exploring a switch mode operation in which perhaps might have a massive MIMO, and when energy is not a big concern, uh, a massive MIMO is utilized, but uh, when perhaps uh, starts having limited energy, the operation might be switched to uh, reconfigurable intelligent services mode, uh, which has some more modest returns in comparison to a massive MIMO, but utilizes uh, less power. And then the last paper is also on uh, self-evolving uh, um, uh, integrated vertical head nets, but the viewpoint there is a hierarchi hierarchical um, federated learning approach. 
Now, this slide is from our first work, which appeared at uh, Transactions on Wireless Communications. But um, I will skip that and move to the current paper directly. And I will uh, motivate the work from the view diagram. But at the moment, let us put aside the hats. What you see is an intelligent highway um, uh, and uh, roadside units. Each roadside unit has some coverage area, it provides connectivity, uh, but also uh, edge intelligence. So there is computational offloading from vehicle to the roadside unit. And naturally, as vehicles move, uh, and a vehicle moves from the coverage area of a roadside unit to the next one, and then this results in handoff. Handoff, as uh, I'm sure everyone would be familiar, is not a very desired operation, even from connectivity viewpoint, lots of overhead, and sometimes the connection might also be, be lost. But when it comes to edge computing framework, uh, it is really not desirable because uh, uh, let us consider a scenario, a vehicle offloads a task to a roadside unit uh, to which it is in communications with, but then the vehicle, by the time the roadside unit completes that task, the vehicle is in the coverage of the next roadside unit. So what will happen? Either all that computation will be lost or done unnecessarily, uh, and then there will be a repeat, or in the core network, the outcome should be moved to the next roadside unit that will create traffic uh, in the network connecting the roadside units. Or the network can have intelligence to detect that by the time this task will be finished and the, the end result sent to the vehicle, the vehicle will not be there anymore. So it may not do the computation, but then there is a lot of, lots of opportunity for edge computing. Um, uh, by the way, I'm, uh, I, I suggest that I finish my presentation since we are uh, recording and then we, I entertain the questions and we can have the discussion at Again. So uh, basically, whichever uh, method you use, either there is excessive delay, repeated calculation, or loss of opportunity. Now comes HAPS into the picture. HAPS has a very large footprint. It can easily cover a highway of uh, 50 kilometers, for instance. Uh, with several spot beams. Apps can have a hundred or hundreds of spot beams. Each spot beam is like a cell or, or a macro cell in this case. So uh, in, the, in one single spot beam, there will be several roadside units. And uh, when there is a situation in which um, uh, the completion of an offloaded task to a roadside unit would not be finished uh, by the time the vehicle moves to the next area, this task actually can be offloaded to HAPS rather than the roadside unit. Uh, in that way, we would be eliminating computational handoff as a matter of fact. And in addition to uh, computational handoff avoidance, another layer of uh, edge computing uh, also helps in general. Uh, and I should also add that uh, HABs can have lots of computational power, much more than uh, roadside units. So if there is a congestion at the roadside unit, uh, basically there is not enough computational capacity Perhaps might come into the picture. Um, so what we are proposing is a three-layer edge computing framework. A task 
can be performed locally. Uh, and uh, actually in this paper, we use the term local and uh, intelligent and connected vehicle ICE interchangeably. So a task may not be offloaded. It can be just uh, computed locally, or it can be offloaded and computed at a roadside unit or the third layer at the hats. When we are doing these uh, decisions, we are uh, aware of the computational end of restriction and that is prevented. We cast this as an optimization problem. Uh, and here in this uh, ICC 2023 paper, uh, the, the cost function, the utility is to uh, minimize the sum delay across all vehicles in the covered area of one spot beam of a HAPS, which would mean a number of uh, roadside units. Um, so we, we uh, calculate the delay experienced by each vehicle and there would be arguably tens of vehicles there and we would minimize the sum delay. Obviously one can come up with uh, many other utility functions for instance, each individual delay is also very important in delay sensitive applications. Fairness is important. Those other utilities are discussed in the uh, transactions on wireless communications paper, which is available um, in uh, early access. And uh, what are what are our uh, decision outcomes? We have a number of allocations. First of all, task allocation or splitting. Basically, uh, how much of a given task should be done locally, locally at the roadside or hacks? This allocation is, uh, is an output of our optimization. Also, when the vehicle offloads the data to hacks or roadside unit, uh, it obviously consumes power and it has a power budget. So how much power to be allocated is uh, also a decision factor. This will also, this offloading will consume bandwidth as well. Likewise, how much of it is available bandwidth the vehicle should uh, allocate to the RSU side and how much to the HAP side, that is another uh, outcome. And these three uh, outcomes are at the individual vehicle level, but then the problem has another viewpoint. At HAPS and also at a roadside unit, there is a computation uh, budget, a computation power, let us say in the HAPS, a terracycles per second is the computational power. And this power should be allocated to all the users uh, that it is serving or asking for uh, computational offloading. Therefore, there is a computing allocation uh, decision also to be made. Now, look at the picture on the below left. These uh, parallel, these uh, computational offloading it is done in parallel. So uh, part of the computation, uh, for instance, the below arrow, this X is, uh, in this uh, optimization, whether we are talking about task power bandwidth or computation, we cast it as fractions, which add up to unity. So um, uh, we might have some task, uh, let us say one megabyte or gigabyte, what fraction of that should be offloaded perhaps, for instance, 0 0.2, that is shown by X, N is the vehicle index and H refers to hats. Likewise, X and R is the fraction that is offloaded to the roadside unit. And if you subtract the two from one, that will give you the amount of work to be done locally. And if I look at the first bar, that is uh, the work to be done locally, locally, obviously there is no offloading time there. 
just at computation time. But in the second and third bars, which are the situation at uh, heads and roadside unit, first, some time is necessary to offload the data to heads or roadside unit, and then there will be a computation. Note that all these three are happening in parallel. Therefore, the longest one will dominate the delay. So if we are trying to maximize the delay, actually, if I use this picture, the longest time is uh, actually the one at HAPS. So uh, the, the lowest bar will dictate and that will be the uh, overall delay. Now on the right hand side, here I am being vigilant of the handoff situation. A roadside unit, has a radius shown by capital D, let us say 150 meters, I think this is the number we used in simulations, and L sub N for the vehicle index N is showing the location of uh, the vehicle with respect to some reference point. And imagine there are roadside units one after another. Therefore, if I basically take um, that I n, which might be, let us say, 3.7 kilometers from a reference point, and use it, to take it as mod E, it is showing how much into that particular um, uh, cell, if I may say, covered by the roadside unit the vehicle is in. So if I subtract um, D or uh, that, L mod D from D, that shows how far away the vehicle from the cell edge. At cell edge, handoff will uh, occur. Now, if I divide that with the vehicle speed, that gives me a timestamp. That is telling me that uh, so many seconds, milliseconds, whatever the unit is, later, um, the handoff uh, will occur. So what is the significance of that? Look at the uh, blue bar, that is the roadside unit offloading, and uh, uh, where the arrow is, it is the offloading time plus the computation time. That time, uh, that is the amount of time it will take to finalize this task, that should be less than the time step because if it is more than the time stamp, then a handoff, computational handoff will occur, which is not good. This is something we are trying to avoid. So in that situation, either the computation should be done locally, or since we are asking for a help, a better offload to hats. In the next slide, I will cast the optimization problem and then unpack this step-by-step. -step. So uh, once again, here, uh, the utility is some delay maximization. Let us examine the utility. Um, I am uh, computing each vehicle's experience delay and lowercase n is the vehicle index and capital N is the number of vehicles in the segment we are analyzing. And remember, that segment is covered by one uh, spot beam of a HAPS, but there will be several roadside units. Um, and then the delay will be dictated by the maximum of three delays. That is the time it takes to execute this operation locally, uh, in parallel, something is happening at the relay, sorry, not relay, roadside unit, as well as at X. The maximum of those three delays will be the delay uh, that user will be experiencing. And uh, what I am doing is I am summing this for all users and try to minimize this. So with this minimization, what I am trying to obtain a number of fractions. So uh, all uh, the variables you see below minimization are values between zero and one. I already mentioned X 
access how much of the task or what percentage I should say, or what fraction is the better word fraction here between zero and one is offloaded to roadside unit and caps. B is, uh, and uh, it, is, it is a vector because I am trying to optimize this across all uh, capital and vehicles in that segment. Likewise, for each vehicle, I try to find how much of the bandwidth the vehicle should allocate to the roadside and perhaps offloading communications. And then the power allocation, each vehicle has it as power uh, budget. The and um, and then uh, the, the last two variables are at HAPS and at roadside unit, uh, basically e each of those uh, entities have it is, has it his own computational power. Um, uh, how much, how should that be distributed across capital and vehicles they are serving? We have a number of constraints. Uh, first and foremost, uh, for every vehicle, there is a kind of uh, stamp, time stamp, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, if this task is offloaded to the uh, roadside unit, the total delay, or sorry, the delay at the roadside unit should be less than the, uh, this hand of uh, uh, this time stamp. The rest are, uh, I guess, quite straightforward. The total bandwidth uh, normalized should be less than unity for each vehicle. Likewise, for each vehicle, uh, the, the, the power should be less than unity. And for HAPS and um, uh, each of the capital and roadside units, uh, the total computational resources allocated should be uh, the, the less than less than unity. Now, next, let me examine once again those delays. The easiest one should be the the, the delay at local computing because there there is no offloading part. And if I look at uh, this uh, delay, that is the first line on the right hand side. Epsilon shows the amount of uh, task in bits. So this might be 100 megabits or bytes of data. Now, then it has to be scaled by that lambda, and that is showing each bit how many uh, computation cycles that will require. So the task will need some operation. Each bit might require three cycles. Therefore, it has to be weighted accordingly. So lambda times epsilon is the number of cycles uh, computationally. So that is how much computation the task requires. If I multiply that with the fraction uh, that is to be done uh, locally, then I, I find the amount of operations that is to be done uh, at, the, at the vehicle. And obviously that fraction is one minus what is sent to roadside unit and pass. Now, in the numerator, I have so many cycles per second. If I divide that by the computational power of uh, L again here, denoting the vehicle, that will give me the time it will take to execute that computation. Um, next, I will just go to the hacks, uh, the situation in hacks. Uh, which is now a bit more complicated, or not complicated, but more things are happening there. Uh, but let me start from the rightmost element, which is pretty much similar to the what I discussed locally. So in the numerator, you see the task epsilon uh, scaled by uh, how many cycles are needed for each bit, and then um, uh, scaled again by how much of it is pushed to the HAPS. Now that is divided by uh, HAPS computational capacity and how much of that allocated to this particular vehicle shown by N. 
So the rightmost expression is showing you the computation time. Now on the left hand side, what we see is, uh, that is sorry, on the right hand side, the first two expressions, well, basically the distance to the haps divided by speed of light, that is the, the time first bit reaches uh, haps, that is like latency. And then the amount of time it will take to push this data to haps. And that time is nothing but uh, the amount of data divided by the link rate. Let us look at the numerator. Once again, epsilon is the total task scaled by the fraction that is being pushed to the haps. So numerator, I have bits. And in the denominator, I have rate according to Shannon equation. So this is bandwidth times spectral efficiency. And when I look at the bandwidth, that is the total bandwidth available to the vehicle and fraction of that, that is allocated to vehicle that is n to hat link. So bandwidth times log two one plus SNR. And when I look at SNR, the, in the numerator, there is this received signal power at haps uh, divided by noise power. And noise power is nothing but noise power spectral density times the bandwidth for that link, which I already analyzed. And in the numerator, um, T is the total transmit power, but only a fraction of that is dedicated to this link times the uh, uh, basically path loss. And as you can check in the paper, we have a path loss, different path loss models for the HAPS and roadside units with the vehicle. For the HAPS, we assume a line of sight link with racian fading, but for the roadside unit, due to all kinds of uh, blockages, we have uh, a path loss exponent. Uh, I believe in the simulations we use 3.7, and we have rail fading as well. And I wouldn't go through the uh, middle line that is very similar to uh, the HAPS computing delay, but there is a mixed type. Uh, here where you see H, those capital H's which are superscript, they should have been R because that is for the uh, relay. Um, after this paper uh, published, uh, when I was reading, I uh, thought that we could have done even a little bit better in modeling in the following sense. Um, here there is an assumption that once you offload uh, some part of the data to roadside unit or haps, and then uh, it is uh, processed there. Uh, the, the result is very short in bits. So it is transmission to the user will not take much time and probably that is realistic. Uh, however, there will still be latency and this latency would be uh, more dominant in the uh, haps connectivity so I wish we have put a two here, uh, basically in the very below line, uh, when you see T and H equal to distance divided by speed of light, uh, there could have been a two there to capture the latency in the, in the reverse thing. But these results, I mean, this small uh, thing will not uh, have, I don't think any change in the, in the results. Anyhow, uh, I would like to wrap this up in the next couple of minutes. Um, that optimization problem is non-convex. And then um, we did a lot of um, work, uh, if I may say, abracadabra to solve the optimization problem. And we resort to successive uh, convex approx uh, approximation. Um, the journal paper in very detail explains this algorithm step by step uh, through various auxiliary variables and relaxations, but I will not get into that. Basically, one can obtain a suboptimal result, whether using uh, successive convex optimization or some other means. Now, I will show some results. Um, and the figures are, this figure is a bit busy, 
let us focus only on the solid lines because partial lines are for another optimization framework, which I didn't discuss, but it is in the journal paper. So we see three uh, solid lines, green, red, and blue. Um, and on the vertical axis, after uh, this optimization framework, which is um, in a way min sum, uh, minimizing the sum delay, if I cast optimization in that manner, uh, I am here observing the average delay for all vehicles as a function of bandwidth, the link between vehicle and roadside unit and hats. Obviously, as the bandwidth is more, I will be reducing a portion of the delay. Therefore, um, you would expect that this will be a monotonically decreasing function. But more interesting part is, um, um, is the following. If I start with the green curve, which is without haps. That is the legacy computational offloading in an intelligent transportation system. That is, it is a two-tier system. You do it locally and part of the task you offload to the roadside unit. Now, instead of roadside unit, if you use HAPS, it is still a two-tier system, the red curve, solid curve, but it is local and HAPS. Here we see a big advantage why first HAPS has more resources, uh, for instance, for computation, um, and it does not suffer from this, um, um, uh, the, basically, um, the, the, the um, uh, computational uh, handoff situation. Therefore, there is a substantial improvement. And if you look at the blue curve, which is a three-tier system, um, HRVIN, I think it stands for HAPS, roadside unit vehicle, all three tiers integrated network, the situation is even better. Um, the next slide, and I will only focus on, on the left-hand side, which is the sum delay optimization. Again, the right-hand side is another optimization framework. This is showing with respect to vehicular speed <inaudible> on the vehicular axis, the, the, the total uh, failed workload. So uh, the uh, brown curve is without hats. That is the baseline, if I may say legacy, it is kind of misleading because there is, I don't think there is a successful um, edge of loading scheme yet, but legacy with respect to literature, that is uh, vehicle of loading data to, uh, to only roadside unit. And once again, due to computational of loading situations, uh, there is a substantial failed workload. And this has a lot of impact, uh, which is not discussed here, but in the uh, uh, this uh, uh, impact comes as a delay, wasted resources, so on and so forth. On the other hand, if HAPS is in the picture, uh, much of these situations are avoided. And then uh, probably uh, last performance slide. Uh, once again, I am looking at the sum delay optimization that I discussed. Uh, uh, on the right-hand side, it is the three-tier network with hats. On the left-hand side, it is a two-tier network that is local and roadside unit. And uh, once again, you see uh, two cases. One of them, uh, the, the handoff situation is incorporated or not in incorporated. So when handoffs are present, you see the average delay is uh, almost more than doubled. It's tripled, perhaps. I mean, uh, the exact numbers are all a function of simulation parameters for sure, and the journal paper details all of them. But no matter what you do, the bottom line is, and actually I can go to the last slide, uh, the presence of HAPS gives uh, a big opportunity here. And uh, inclusion of hats is not arbitrary. It is this 
due to the fact that it has a line of sight bird's eye view of a very large segment and without any hand of this super macro base station with a lot of edge computing capability can uh, give service to a large segment of, of, a, of a highway or a road in uh, intelligent connected network um, infrastructure. So uh, PAPS has potential way more than connectivity. It is a big enabler uh, for uh, computational offloading as well. We have many other works in this area. Similar observations were made uh, in uh, federated learning framework as well. Um, the, uh, rather than doing federated learning with uh, small cells, similar observations are made if HAPS are included. Now, in conclusion, I would like to highlight some further work in the group. Uh, in the beginning of my presentation, I highlighted uh, the overview works uh, in the form of magazine papers. Here, more transactions papers uh, starting, I guess, from the lower uh, right corner. Uh, that work is um, on link budget analysis with uh, reconfigurable intelligent surfaces in the presence of um, aerial platforms. And then uh, the next uh, two uh, papers are uh, related to apps selection in an uh, in links with in space optical links as well in a uh, in an integrated network with satellites as well, um, and then uh, the one that is up an accurate model for computational offloading. Well, this is uh, basically a, a first order simulation test bed creation to analyze computational offloading. It just came out at the end of last year. Um, I already mentioned uh, Shishi's first paper, which is within the framework of uh, this work. The one above is our first uh, journal paper on interference management in an integrated HAPS terrestrial network, in, uh, intelligent radio resource management. This is an active area. Uh, and uh, a lot of work is uh, under preparation for submission. We also analyze uh, uh, free space optical based TAPS backhauling in the context of uh, cybersecurity and eavesdropping. It goes without saying that FSO has lots of advantages in comparison to radio. In radio, the signal is scattered everywhere, but that's not the case, and it is FSO. Uh, and then the first paper on the right column is on uh, the utilization of apps in localization and uh, positioning. A paper came out uh, recently. Then I am moving to the uh, first column from the below. Uh, this is uh, this paper is on uh, on the management of a, uh, vertical heterogeneous networks with terrestrial network, apps, and satellites. Um, and it is uh, asked as a self evolving network, which is an, a more advanced viewpoint in comparison to uh, self organizing networks that we are familiar with. Uh, the, the paper up is uh, on uh, NOMA and cold book design in. Uh, in HAPS enabled integrated uh, terrestrial stratospheric networks. Um, the next one is on HAPS risk. This is also a very active area in my group. Uh, risk. HAPS risk seems to be a good synergy, at least from two angles. One of them is HAPS can have a very large surface. It can actually lift uh, a risk which is 100 meter by 100 meter, which is of course inconceivable for a terrestrial network. And it is very fitting to the HAPS architecture as HAPS is energy limited. And then the next paper of uh, 
is basically this paper I presented today. It is the journal version. Uh, the one about that, uh, the two papers are waiting for issues, accepted papers, another paper on uh, uh, positioning in a HAPS augmented uh, network with terrestrial and satellite nodes as well. Localization, positioning, uh, HAPS has big help to offer. The one about uh, just got accepted, it is on uh, the promise of stratosphere in federated learning, in hierarchical federated learning. Um, and then the top three papers are under review uh, uh, on um, uh, cell-free massive MIMO enabled through HAPS utilizing sub terahertz band, cell edge capacity with full duplex HAPS. And the first paper is um, uh, another technical work on um, anomaly detection in a vertical head neck. Now, if these things uh, sound interesting, let us have a conversation, not necessarily right after this presentation, uh, but uh, through email and uh, for people from overseas, uh, my lab at Carlton, uh, very uh, well positioned to uh, have uh, visitors short term and long term, we can talk about that as well. And in very final slide, this summer, uh, we are in the process of establishing a non-terrestrial networks lab at Carlton University. This lab uh, will consolidate our work, which has been taking place in the last um, almost eight years since 2015, in four streams. One of them, uh, my interest in NPM started with aerial networks with UAVs. Uh, they can be a user like a cargo drone or a base station. And then uh, stratospheric networks through high altitude platform stations, individual and as a constellation. And then about that space network with several layers but in particular, low Earth orbit satellite mega constellations is a very big topic. Uh, we have a large team at Carlton and indeed uh, building that team further. We recently got a major project from uh, Canadian government and uh, Canadian industry. Um, and finally, uh, the first three bullets can be investigated as standalone networks or more interestingly, as an integrated network with the uh, terrestrial IMT networks, these are the 4G, 5G, 6G type of networks. I'm uh, stopping sharing here. And uh, if I can, I will also uh, stop um, recording, but for that, just give me a moment. Um, I have to find here the recording button. And I just uh, lost that post. 